Kendall, um, and thank you to everybody who's stuck around uh, to the end to hear this presentation. I do appreciate uh, your your, uh, your patience and uh, for bearing with me. So I'll just click my shared screen and hopefully you can all see my Prezi. Yes, perfect, thanks. Excellent. Um, okay, so the presentation I'm gonna give today is, uh, it's fairly conceptual, it's, it's based on uh, kind of an amalgamation of um, data from my own uh, research into various different martial arts, but focusing on some of the stuff that I've done in MMA, um, as well as a reading of several other studies, ethnographic and interview-based studies, uh, published over the last 10 years or so of this uh, very exciting and relatively new full contact combat sport. So it's not a study per se, it's more of a sort of a, a bringing together of, uh, of data from various sources to think through um, a particular concept which we heard about a moment ago in Paul's talk, uh, this notion of edge work, uh, which some of you might be familiar with, uh, others may not. So I'll, I'll start off by defining what that means uh, and how we can use it to think about sport um, before moving forward to apply it to mixed martial arts and then get to the, the crux of my argument today, which builds on some of my previous work on uh, violence in sport. And we had a question earlier, I think, which, which alluded to uh, difficulties in pinning down an exact definition of violence. And it's around that sort of issue that I want to use edge work to propose something um, that might seem counterintuitive to some, um, but I think is, is a useful and uh, in many ways quite meaningful contribution to uh, the study of martial arts from a, a sociological perspective. And that is to challenge the notion that um, MMA is uh, a form of violence. So I'll start off then with, with edge work itself. Um, for those who aren't familiar, uh, it's, it's generally attributed to the, the writer, the, the researcher rather, Stephen Ling, who's a sociologist who um, initially used the concept of edge work to discuss um, very high risk, uh, what we might call extreme sports, um, and particularly to focus on voluntary risk taking by people who take part in them. Ling has applied the concept to other, uh, other forms of um, you know, social life as well as uh, you know, beyond sport. Um, and himself, he, he borrows it from uh, the journalist Hunter S. Thompson, who I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, um, who used uh, this, this notion of uh, you know, crossing the edge um, to describe uh, particularly drug taking um, and involvement in criminal activities. So edge work as a concept, um, sometimes it's erroneously used as a synonym for extreme risk taking. Um, edge work is quite a specific type of behavior involving risk. Um, one of the characteristics of edge work is that it involves some kind of edge. So as I put on the screen there, um, you know, for example, the edge between life and death. You know, the stakes are very, very high there. You can't really get much more risky than uh, when your life is at risk. Um, but it could be um, an activity which brings you close to the edge between consciousness and unconsciousness or sanity and madness, for instance. So it's an activity which involves bringing you close to one of these sort of high stakes edges or boundaries. Edge work is not simply uh, an engagement in risk for its own sake. The type of activity that edge work is engaged in is always controlled. It's, it's carefully calculated, it's measured, it's planned, it's prepared for. It's a kind of edge, a kind of risk taking rather, um, that gives us a chance to experience uh, extreme disorienting fear, uh, the emotional rush of being in a situation where you know, your life is on the line, um, not simply for the adrenaline rush, but so that we might experience a sense of mastery in overcoming the risk that's involved with approaching that edge. This is a really important aspect of edge work. And this is, this is what separates edge work from other forms of, uh, of sort of daredevil risk taking. The point of doing this is to test um, yourself really, to, to sort of get to know your true self and see if you've got what it takes to survive in conditions where most people would not be able to, uh, to manage. So um, some classic examples of edge work, as you can see from some of the images there, something like skydiving, you know, flying, jumping out of a plane. Um, you have the capacity to survive that because you don't do it without a parachute and you don't do it without any training. You do have the physical tools that you need to survive this. Um, this is more a test of your, uh, you know, of your ability to remain in control when you're in this extremely unfamiliar, disorienting and terrifying situation. Uh, we might think of edge work in, in other sporting contexts like mountaineering, uh, free diving, uh, for instance, um, and then activities beyond sport, which the, the concept has been applied to. Um, I've put an image of Stacey Newmar's book there about sadomasochism um, on the on the uh, on the form, which is quite an interesting uh, application of the of the concept, which I'll come back to. Uh, but it's also been used in studies of uh, stock trading and in, in criminology research on on the commission of violent crime. So placing oneself in a situation where 
uh, there's an extreme risk, there's a negotiation of some sort of boundary that gives us the opportunity to, uh, to gain a sense of mastery over chaos and test if we have what it takes um, to survive this, this extremely disorienting experience. Ling describes this as giving us an opportunity for self-actualization, which I'm sure is a, a concept where most of us will be familiar with, this notion of you know, getting to know my real true self. Um, Ling argues that in late modern life, we have very few opportunities to do this. Um, and so edge work as a, as a practice, it, it sort of explains the rise of uh, you know, participation in extreme sports, uh, particularly among people who um, you know, have, have nine to five sort of corporate life jobs, rather boring, rather monotonous. Um, edge work gives you a chance to experience something that's far more um, authentic or understood to be far more authentic than um, our daily lives, which are highly contrived and controlled and so on and so on. So that's really the sort of core of the concept. It's a very calculated form um, of risk taking. Now, mixed martial arts, I would argue, has many of the characteristics that Ling describes as being uh, you know, features of edge work. Certainly, MMA is a very intense physical sport. Uh, I'm sure we've all seen or, or, or you know, encountered the, the sport. Some of you might be fans of the sport and watch it regularly. Um, we know that there are, you know, the, the, the sport gives us opportunities to navigate the boundary between consciousness and unconsciousness very clearly. There's a lot of knockouts in mixed martial arts. Also, the boundary between being whole and being broken. Um, we often see people, for instance, winning, winning fights by applying joint locks to, to their opponent. So, you know, you might break your arm in MMA. There's a, there's a negotiation of that boundary there. But also, as, besides from the, the physical demands, the cognitive and emotional components of MMA are also very important. And that's why I've, I've put this image here of the, uh, the fighter about to enter the cage. This moment of stepping into this environment where, um, you know, once that door closes and this fight begins, you know, you're in a full contact fight. Very much, if we, we borrow this, the concept of mimesis from, uh, from Elias, you know, this, this sense of fighting for your life, right? It's a very close approximation of a, you know, of a quote unquote real fight. So the emotional onslaught that that generates is um, significant. And for most MMA fighters and the narratives they give about what it means to fight uh, and the experience of being in the cage, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's an all encompassing sensation. And being able to survive that emotional onslaught, that rush of energy, that um, distortion of perception, the feeling that you know, time is speeding up and slowing down at the same time um, is certainly uh, akin to other activities which, uh, which Ling describes in his Edgework thesis. So MMA certainly involves the opportunity to experience the same kind of emotional trouble um, and to then you know, impose mastery over that um, and to achieve this, this notion of um, you know, perhaps self-actualization through uh, what is often referred to as an ultimate fight. Very, very clear in the discourse of MMA that this is the most ultimate form of fighting. I put a couple of uh, paraphrased quotes there that are borrowed from some of the literature which I cite in the paper um, that I published on the basis of this presentation. Um, you know, the, a mixed martial arts fight is more a test of self than skill. We spend an awful lot of time preparing, we train, we, we build up our strength, our stamina, our technique, we game plan for our opponents, we put all the pieces in place so that we can win this fight. What I'm really testing, it's not necessarily my skills, it's can I stay in control? Can I remain composed? Can I, can I actually um, perform when the chips are down and when it really matters when that cage door closes? It's more a test of who I am than a test necessarily of my skill. Um, and a, a titular quote there from a paper which I love, uh, fighting is the most real and honest thing by Brenton Kraska, that I get to know who I really am when I'm fighting. I get to see what I'm really made of. So these kind of things are borne out very well in the empirical research on, on mixed martial arts. And if anyone uh, listening has ever um, participated in a uh, full contact combat sports match, hopefully these are, this is ringing some bells for you and um, you recognize what I'm talking about. Now, one important thing, one very important thing about MMA, which, which builds towards my, my central argument here with respect to violence, is the necessity of collaboration. I briefly mentioned the work on sadomasochism that uses edge work uh, as, a, as a, a theoretical construct, Stacey Newmar's work. And she raises this point there. It's, it's a, a lot of similarities between S&M and MMA, which I'm not going to unpack today. Um, but certainly this notion of collaboration is absolutely essential. So in mixed martial arts, our opportunity to experience the emotional roller coaster that gives us a chance to demonstrate to ourselves and to our, to our, uh, you know, to our, uh, our friends and family and so on what we're really made of, that isn't possible unless I have an opponent who's genuinely trying to beat me. I need someone to try to knock me out in order to test whether I can survive in a fight where someone's trying to knock me out. I want to know if I've got what it takes to survive this encounter, so I need this other person to try their hardest to beat me. Um, the quote there, uh, he is going to be my Everest, that's lifted from um, a piece of fieldwork I did recently, 
um, on a study of medical care in MMA, which some of you looked at my poster earlier. This was something that a fighter said to me backstage before he went out to his, his fight, that he saw his opponent was going to be the biggest challenge that he would ever face, right? He's going to be my Everest. Clearly drawing parallels there with uh, the well-established um, notion of, of uh, mountaineering as, uh, as a form of edge work. So what I would argue that there are many things we can take out of this that are, that are important for sociological analysis of this sport. Um, but this notion of respect, martial artists often talk about the respect in their sport. And I want to just sort of challenge that a little bit. I think it, it's become a kind of a careless discourse, one of the myths of martial arts. It's all about respect. What does that actually mean? Where does that respect come from? Why do we respect each other? Uh, what is it about our opponents, our training partners that we respect? One of the things that's quite a common refrain in the, the MMA community is that, um, you know, paraphrasing, you know, quote unquote, I respect anyone with the guts to step into the cage. So anybody who's got what it takes, anybody who can demonstrate to themselves and to us as the community, that they've got what it takes to step in and face this challenge, regardless of how good they are at the sport, I respect them. So this sense of community, this, this mutuality, this respect that exists among groups of fighters um, is largely articulated around the demonstration that you've got the right stuff, that you've successfully completed uh, the edge work of MMA. I would go so far as to say that that is one of the reasons that we see scenes like the, the image on the bottom right there, this sort of outpouring of affection um, between people who, you know, moments before were trying to knock each other unconscious or, or, you know, choke each other out or force each other to submit to an extremely painful joint lock. Immediately at the conclusion of that fight, it's smiles, hugs, high fives. Not always, um, but certainly I would say this is a norm um, in this sport. I would argue that the, the mutuality and the necessity of collaboration is what makes this, um, you know, this a common sight. So, Edge work is this calculated form of risk that gives us a chance to experience self-actualization through mastery. Edge work in MMA requires collaboration. And this brings me to the last point, and I, I do apologize, folks, because I'm going to uh, whiz very, very quickly through some more conceptual stuff that probably needs its own presentation uh, or maybe you know, a, a two-hour discussion to really get to the bottom of. Um, I'm building here on some of my previous work with Dr. Christopher Matthews, where we've argued that fighting and violence are not the same thing. We've been uh, quite critical of scholars who write about combat sports or sports involving physical contact, uh, who describe them as violent or as forms of violence without critically thinking about what they mean by this term violence. We argue this is necessary given the, uh, the stigmatizing connotations of the word violence, but also the empirical fact that quite often in studies of these sports, people who participate in them explicitly say things like these, these paraphrased quotes here, you know, I'm not a violent person. MMA isn't real violence, you know, or if you compare MMA to real violence, then it's different. So there's this insinuation from people on the inside of this, these sports that there's something different, that it's not, you know, real violence. So we wanted to get to the bottom of this and we wrote a few papers and we've, we've advocated for, you know, thinking more carefully about what we mean by violence, arguing that violence shouldn't be seen as a static object, as a fixed thing with a simple definition, that violence should be seen as a characteristic of interaction. Violence is something which people do to each other. So if we want to understand what is and isn't violent, we need to look at those interactions. We need to look at the meanings people bring to those interactions. And we need to look at them in situ and be careful um, applying this term violence sort of, you know, prima facie without asking those kinds of questions. To cut a very long story short, we argue that violence needs to be thought of in sports contexts as a combination of both forceful um, actions, but also violations against the person. There are two well-established sort of paradigms in violence studies, violence as force, violence as violation. We're arguing that a combination of these two is very useful to help us understand participants' narratives of what is and isn't violence in sport. Ultimately, we argue that consent is absolutely key, uh, that what people consent to, while, while not the only factor that matters here, consent is, is a you know, core structure and principle of what separates things that I might feel um, as a form of violence against me from something that I don't. Um, to bridge briefly back to a previous study of mine on um, sex integration in combat sports, many women that I interviewed about their experience of training with, uh, with men, um, they felt that um, when men would hold back and not, not hit them properly in sparring, they felt that that was, um, you know, it, it stunted their development as martial artists, but they felt also that this kind of excluded them um, from being a proper martial artist. It was a source of frustration for many women that I spoke to. Um, it's not just that they that they didn't mind that men would hit them, they actively wanted men to hit them. As a martial artist, as a combat sports practitioner, I need my partners to hit me in order to get better. So this is something which we proactively want to see happening to us. 
for people who haven't done martial arts, this can be, you know, particularly when we're talking about men hitting women, this can be um, a bit of a head scratcher. Uh, but empirically, I say this, this, this stands up quite well across the research that, that I've done and also that others have done in this field. People in martial arts want their sparring partners, they want their opponents to actually try to hit them. And this leads us to something of a paradox. Um, you may or may not be persuaded by the very, very brief attention I've given to this notion that MMA is not categorically violence. If it doesn't involve violation, it's not violence. You might not be persuaded by that, that's fine. As long as we recognize there's something different about the actions that take place in the cage, the punching and the kicking there, um, compared to the same sort of thing happening in a different social context with different social meanings. This is still sort of an unresolved paradox though. Why is it that people, as we can see on the right here, in, you know, in one hand they want to, um, they, they claim to sort of love and respect each other, they hug, they kiss each other, they high five and so on, but they also punch and kick and choke each other. How on earth is this uh, possible? How does this make sense? We've argued previously that it makes sense because it's, it's not violence, it's not something that's understood as a violation, it's not something which um, people feel um, is inappropriate or illegitimate. Um, but when we think about this notion of edge work, this sort of fills in some of the blanks. Actually, you know, I want people to do this to me because this is what gives me the opportunity to take hold of that thing that I really value, which is the chance to test myself. If my opponent doesn't genuinely try to hurt me, then they're actually doing me a disservice. So in a sense, MMA um, edge work enables this, this self-actualization process. It depends on collaboration. It depends on this community of people doing this to each other. So fighters are rather than forcefully violating each other, treating each other as worthless objects to damage, um, as some critics have said, fighters provide a high value service to each other. I need you to do this to me in order to, to get the most out of my investment in this sport. So I'll conclude this presentation, I know I've gone a little bit over time, um, by saying that rather than thinking uncritically of MMA as a violent sport, that the action involves violence, I would actually suggest that we think about the action of MMA as a mutual construction of risk. Um, and not violence per se. If uh, you want to read a little bit more about this, uh, this is the paper that uh, in 10,000 words, try to squeeze that into 15 minutes, uh, makes this argument in a, in a more robust way. You can get this as open access with the Martial Arts Studies Journal. Uh, I'll put a link in the, in the chat in a moment. Um, and some of the other stuff that I've written that, that sort of expounds on, um, uh, on the theoretical points that I've uh, raised before, all of these referenced in the, uh, in the, in the paper. And that's me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was that was awesome. Um, we do have a question. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and let Anastasia unmute herself and ask that question. Thank you very much. A great presentation, Alex. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of theoretical and conceptual work. And I wonder, people still perceive, people outside academia, they still perceive um, MMA and combat sports as something quite violent. How do you think your research can be used to actually challenge this stereotype outside the academia? Okay, so one of the things that I very briefly showed um, a moment ago was um, uh, from a project that, that Dr. Matthews, who I mentioned a moment ago, and I uh, have been running for a few years, which uh, we call Love Fighting, Hate Violence. And the idea of Love Fighting, Hate Violence is to use this kind of theoretical idea that, you know, that combat sports are, are not categorically violence and that consent is what makes them um, not categorically violent, um, to use that as a, a kind of pedagogical intervention, a tool um, to teach particularly young people about consent uh, and about that sort of mutual respect and about personal boundaries and, and so on and so on, um, to use this, this uh, you know, martial arts activities as a way to um, help them to understand what violence is, where, where violence begins and ends. So if you think about you know, a lot of the things that, that you know, the claims that are made for martial arts training more broadly, you know, we can use this to, um, you know, solve bullying at school, or we can use it to cure antisocial behavior or to make young kids respectful. What we've argued is that, you know, by attending to the importance of consent to, uh, in martial artists narratives of what, what makes it nonviolent, um, we can try and teach people about this, you know, this really important um, ethical issue through, uh, you know, fun and engaging martial arts based activities. If anyone's interested in this, I, I don't feel like I'm, I'm doing it justice in the, uh, in the hurried moments that I'm watching this countdown <laughs> while I'm answering the question. If anybody's interested in love, fighting, hate, violence, um, you can go to uh, www.lfhv.org um, and read all about it, including the manifesto that I um, added on the, um, on the slide there. Great, thank you. Um, we do have a question from another audience member. 
members. So I'm going to go ahead and allow them to talk. And if you wouldn't mind uh, announcing your name. Um, what's up, everybody? I'm sorry, I was muted. My name is Rudy Mondragon. I'm coming from uh, UCLA and Chicano and Chicano Studies. And uh, Alex, your, your, your work and conceptualization on um, on violence is, 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 is very welcome because the, the how you contextualize it. I, I do work on boxing. And uh, I was just thinking about your framework on edge work and, and even like just thinking about like MMA and how the, the if, if MMA fighters in the US, for example, are as independent contractors with, with like a very uh, unregulated sport is also a form of calculated risk that fighters go into understanding that they're getting themselves into. Um, and so we also know about like how violence has been used in the past in terms of like Filipinos um, and the Spanish during the colonial time to discipline Filipino men through boxing or, or like in the, in the examples of Jack Johnson becoming the first black heavyweight champion of the world. And so in MMA, how, to what extent do you see the, this kind of activity of, um, of fighting um, and edge work and risk calculated risk uh, and and how manifestations of of dissent and resistance are also taking place within an MMA context. I don't think I've seen a lot of, I've seen ring entrances and I've seen moments of MMA fighters coming out and doing very unique performances of dissent. So I was wondering if, if you've been able to see that in your work through this framework of edge work and calculated risks. Thanks, Rudy. Thanks. It's a it's a great question. Um, I'll, I've only got a uh, short time, so I'll, I'll try and sort of focus this. Um, the argument that we've made is, is uh, you know, the, the action of MMA is not violence per se. It doesn't preclude, um, you know, there is violence in MMA. Of course, there is violence, whether that's physical violence that takes place outside of the parameters of consent or the more structural forms of violence, like you, you mentioned, the independent contractors, um, you know, clearly a, a, a major issue for, you know, people who are advocates of athletes' rights and the professionalization of sport, uh, that athletes should share in the, the rewards, their risk, the, the risks they take bring. Um, I think one of the problems that we've got with this, uh, this notion of edge work in MMA is that even though it's a very conceptually interesting idea, it sort of points our attention towards the widespread normalization and celebration of risk taking in the sport. And we see this not just in uh, you know, the physical act of, of fighting, we see it also in um, the, the things that fighters do to their bodies to prepare for fights, weight cutting, extraordinary risk taking that they engage in there. Um, and the valorization of that, right? If you don't cut weight, then, you know, if, if, you, or if you fail a weight cut, then you're not a real fighter. So you've got this sense that you need to be taking these risks. You need to be confronting these boundaries and to not do so would be, you know, in, in some way to fail. Um, and I think that that normalization of risk is something which, you know, among many factors is potentially standing in the way of, of unionization and, and sort of greater collective, um, you know, advocacy for that collective bargaining that fighters need to protect their professional interests. If promoters can rest assured that fighters are, you know, accepting risk and that they are willing to take those things and, and also use risk to prove their status as a, a you know, legitimate member of the community, then, um, you know, occupational hazards associated with being a fighter, uh, uh, they're not so important to address, right? Because people just kind of tacitly accept them and go along with them. So I think this, this notion of edge work can also direct us in, in a quite a critical way to think about how this normalized culture of accepting and celebrating risk in the sport um, can actually work against the interests of the people who, uh, whose labor constitute it. So I'm sorry if that doesn't answer your question fully, but that's, that's the first thing that sprung to mind that there's, you know, there's multiple layers to the question of violence um, and we need to attend to all of them. And I think we have an opportunity to do so there.